Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. You're listening to the Paul Leslie Hour. Before we bring out our special guest, songwriter and recording artist John Goodwin, we're going to play a song from his album, The Next Small Thing. This is his song, Henry Miller. Henry Miller. Well, where do you want to start, Paul? I want to start with the next small thing. Our special guest is John Goodwin, the first guest ever to join us four times. Thanks so much for doing this. Hey, it's my pleasure. I live in relative obscurity, so anytime somebody opens the great social closet and shines a light in here, it's, it's a good thing, Paul. Who is the real John Goodwin? I don't know, man. I've been waiting for him to show up for years, you know. God, man, like, we're, we're people who live like, I don't want to try and be philosophical here, but every day is like a snapshot of us, and then we have, like, larger periods, which could be considered to be volumes about us or whatever. Just another person just walking through the world is uh, the way I see myself. Well, you have this new album. It's called The Next Small Thing. What, yeah. What do you think of your album, The Next Small Thing? Well, this is really embarrassing, Paul, because I'm in love with this record. Although I do see, I can see some flaws, but like, you know, I, I really do. I just sit here like and just occasionally just sit down at night and just listen to it in the headphones. And it's really working for me. I don't know if it's going to work for anybody else, but, you know, I'm really digging it. Is it okay to say that? Like, I am a big fan of when someone is a fan of their own work. Yeah, I think this one especially, of all the records I've made, just ask me another brilliant question. <laughs> I don't know how brilliant it is, but how would you say the next small thing is different from your past albums? I think what I'm noticing is that the next small thing is like, it's kind of humorous, but it was sort of, un it happened that to be unintentional, and it was like hyper poetry, like there was this whole other language that I started speaking as I was writing it, which wasn't our conversational English that most people speak on the streets or in social settings, you know. And the one and the album before it was more of an acoustic thing. It all it was all it all started as acoustic guitar vocals and then some other tracks were added. So it was much more like folky, whereas this is like I sort of walked off the ed, end of the pier. Tell us about the process of recording the album. Well I just do what you know, a lot of people uh, have come to do these days, and I did it on Garage Band. And you know, there are a lot of people sitting around their houses, like recording songs and tracks and stuff on Garage Band, and and that's really how I did it. My whole feeling is is it doesn't matter whether you do it at home or whether you do it at Abbey Road. It's a matter of getting something into the computer in the form of sounds, and then having it come back and sound good to you. Would you say your songwriting style is changing? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it may be falling apart. <laughs> what makes you say that? You know, the funny thing is, my give a damn is like weaker than it has ever been. But on the other hand, it's really stronger than it's ever been. 
So I care much more about everything and anyone that I ever did. But then again, like I care proportionately less. I just think it's the music that's, these songs on this new album sort of, a lot of them stand in between like being reverent and irreverent or whatever. Why would you say that you're giving a damn less? Well, you know, sometimes people tell me that they're, they're, they have writer's block or they're not writing a lot. And I'm saying, well, the right, like not to write is a really good prerequisite for writing. Because if you don't feel compulsively like you have to do it, you know, you have a, a starting place of complete, like, detachment. Not giving a damn is almost like a place of detachment, but the giving a damn is really trying to intensely tune into, you know, all the different other heartbeats in, in the world. But I, I don't know if you could do that all the time. It might explode, you know, so that there comes a point in which you have to completely take back all that energy and not even relate to it that way. Do you have a favorite song on your album, The Next Small Thing? I can't say that I do. <laughs> I can't say so, man. Like, I mean, I really, I, I hate to say this. It's horrible. I just like a lot of them. Like I said, like they don't sound like $20,000 productions, just a guy and his guitar and a, a microphone and an M-Box and an iMac. But it's like, like I said before, it's like whatever you put in will somewhat determine what comes out. And that's kind of what it's all about. To talk to talk Ain't no meaning Just the sounds Don't you ever Walk to walk Can't go back Or turn around If someone Asks me what it's like To be the joke Of blah blah town I'd just say It's kinda like Being serious In a crowd of there was a cow in Burgundy, the province, not the wine I mean. It had a sense of humanity, was a toast of high society. One day the farmer came to him and said, it's either college or a he said. I'd rather be a burger man than to listen to all your symphonies. Make mine with cheese. John Goodwin's album, The Next Small Thing. That was the next one. Now we're going to take you back to our interview with singer and recording artist John Goodwin. One of the tracks on the album, it's a spoken word poetry piece, Broadway Mystic. Yeah. And it mentions the author and painter Henry Miller. And then yeah. there's also a song called Henry Miller. So have you been reading a lot of Henry Miller lately? Oh, good question, man. Yes, I, I've read some Henry Miller over the years, not lately, but it had occurred to me that Henry Miller, his work was banned in the United States until he was like in his 50s or 60s. And 
because they, they considered a lot of it to be pornographic, like Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, whereas a lot of it was just totally philosophical. A lot of his books were a man writing about the world or other writers and stuff like that. But I think what I was identifying with is that, like, you know, finally, when Henry Miller got to be an old man, he started to sell a lot of books in the U.S. But by that time, like, it's not like he could go out and party all night long and enjoy his fame because, in a sense, it was repressed by our culture. And on the other hand, he did start writing significant works late in his life. I think probably, I'm just guessing here, like after 40. You know, I don't want to be the Henry Miller of, <laughs> of obscure folk rock music or whatever it is I'm making, you know, like, there's a possibility, I see the possibility of that, that one day people, you know, may hear it and go, oh, wow, like when Gaga was Gagaing and Bieber was Biebering, Goodwin was like recording Broadway Mystic, you know, and it may have some meaning. Does that make any sense to you, man? <laughs> yes, it does, actually. And I think the term would be Goodwinning. Perhaps it is. I mean, we should all have a word that's named after us in the English language, don't you think? <laughs> I realize that there's one there's one word in our language which was, which was created and only applies to one person who ever lived, and it's his own personal verb. And this all came to me in some half-blinding flash. You know what that word is? What's the word? Resurrection. Hmm. Like only one person ever ever did it, you know? Oh, yeah, that's true. Let me, let me get on to Broadway Mystic for a second, okay? Sure. Well, actually, this, the, the song, uh, it's sort of the story of my life in Nashville. It's kind of biographical of the last 12 years. Anyway, I don't know if I should say any more than that, but I could read you a couple verses. Of, of, of read you as much as I feel like reading, right? Please do. Pretty wild, man. Because Nashville hasn't been the greatest thing for me in a lot of ways. You know, I'm not. I mean, I, I started writing country music when I was 25, but what they're writing now is very different, too what got me into writing it. Broadway Mystic, I came to help, but I was captured by the pirates of the night. They put me into an invisible box of milky light. And here I am, sitting, watching you walking on a wheel. They guard their game like a thousand angry dogs from hell. While they are on a beach and we are long forgotten history, Will we be looking out a window at a war-torn street, wondering if we'd be safe if we stood up for things that we believed instead of acting like slaves long after we were freed? Meanwhile, what are we going to do with Henry? Mr. Miller is in town. His existence is a contradiction of our low-life ways. He stands there like a fire. We are cold as ice. But history has damaged enough people who will pay our price Still, the hands of time don't know a beggar from an ashkabar, and a queen fits through the same hole as a girl whose life was battered by the tide. Pick up your toys and caravan down to the ancient site. There's a water-walking mystic walking down Broadway tonight. Thank you for letting me read that, Paul. My pleasure. My pleasure. I actually played that piece for a few people, including an Atlanta-area poet who really enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, that's good. It's cool. Do you find you're more attracted to the melody of a song or the lyric? I'd say the whole. there's got to be something about the whole thing. That's the way I feel about it. I, I remember back in the 80s, people, used to, people were talking about records that were being made after the 60s, and in the 80s, people would say, God, I hate the song, but the production's great. And I never really understood that. You know what I'm saying? It's either the song is either you either like it or you don't. I, I never heard a song with bad lyrics and a great melody that I dug, or vice versa. It's, it's all kind of like one thing, isn't it, Paul? I would think so. I remember not too long ago interviewing a lyricist named Marty Panzer, and he said, Marty Panzer said, a song is something you can sing in the shower. A track is a production. Well, you know, you can always invite the band into the shower. <laughs> oh, that, that's wrong. <laughs> one of my favorite songs on the album it's Battle Zone. I've been mm -hmm. listening to that one like crazy. What inspired it? Oh, by the way, Matt, thank you so much for, for even taking the time to listen to the, this, my songs and my music. You know, I really do appreciate it. And I mean, it's always amazing when another person can find three minutes to listen to what a writer did. Battle Zone, that was written. I started to realize a lot of things in my early life that had always troubled me and hung me up. I'd sort of dealt with those and gotten past them and I wasn't 
as and conflict wasn't like tying me up as much in terms of moving forward in my life and doing things. So that's what it was about having been raised in a battle zone, but not living there anymore. Yeah. Great song. I really like this song. I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> you should be. Our special guest on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour is singer and recording artist John Goodwin. We're going to play a song from his album, The Next Small Thing. This is Battle Zone. I was born in a battle zone. I send them heart and home. Colors fighting Cold War figures, borders between ours and theirs. Rockets flying, words exchanged, guilty pleasures, lovers' names. God and country, king and throne, I was born in a battle zone. I don't live there anymore. Sky on fire, world on ice Going once and going twice Sharks and satin wolves and silk Monkeys drunk on tiger's milk I was born in a battle zone But I don't live there anymore Orange karma, violet fields What we win is what we yield Save for those who still are stuck between a cannonball and ice cream truck. I was born in a battle zone. I don't live there anymore. We can't control where we land. Only hope to play a hand in our destinies. Not walk around thinking, what am I here for? I was born in a battle zone, but I don't live there anymore. I don't live there What things inspire you the most? Everything. I swear to God, I could be sitting in a coffee shop and look over and see a freckle on some young woman's arm, and that could become the song I go home and write. Or it could be just anything, everything. I swear to God, man. The only things that don't inspire me, I guess, are the things I haven't written songs about yet. <laughs> Sorry to get convoluted on you, Paul. No, no, not at all. Are you a reader? I think you asked me this on a in our last interview, and, and the, the answer is a little bit embarrassing. I've had major periods in my life where I did a lot of reading continuously, followed by periods in which I read absolutely nothing. I sort of became the only voice in my head when it came to living and seeing life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right now I'm not in a reading period, but whenever, whenever I do read, it's always better for writing. Like, stuff is just better. Do you find sometimes that watching a film can kind of spark your creativity? You know, I just go to movies to get inspired, entertained, sometimes inspired and sometimes transported, because some movies are just phenomenal works of art. There's parts of this album that kind of remind me of the chorus of the Thebans in Oedipus, the play. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have, like, the, it sounds like the voice is echoing. Do the Thebans, like, ever have a Theban pride parade? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but continue on that thought. Well, perhaps. You did a video not too long ago about Malukas, a character. I was just saying that there were parts of the, the album. First of all, you have this voice that you do. You did it on the last album. And I wanted to see, after playing it to other people, if it stuck out in their minds as well. And it does. And then you have this the the explanation of the jokes track where it sounds like the chorus of Thebans in the play Oedipus to me anyways. Yes, yes it's kind of a call and response thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, good observation. Well, anyways, 
Have you ever thought about writing a musical or a play? I guess it's crossed my mind once or twice between getting my coffee and putting my Splenda in my coffee. <laughs> it's terrible, Paul. I'm just so bad. I gave you a choice between whether you wanted to hear like the, the good, polite, socialized John Goodwin or the hippie John Goodwin. You said either one. So I'm sort of coming out as, as you know, my little natural artistic hippie self right now, you know? Well, this is not a question that I told you I was going to ask, but what is the biggest compliment? And this is a really totally Zen kind of answer, you know? But the biggest compliment is the life that the universe gives each one of us in the next moment. Yeah. It's like bow God is bowing to all of us, as are like the sun and the moon. Now, I never expected to say that, Paul. You inspired me into that space. Don't you think? And, we're, and we all receive that compliment, don't we? That's an amazing way to look at it. And that question just popped into my head. I'm glad I asked. Yeah, I'm glad you asked, too. I'm okay with compliment. You know, I hate to be referred to by other people as some kind of superlative being or superlative thinker. Because, you know, it's occurred to me that that's just one more, like, minority that I've, I've joined on, <clears throat> on my life's path. It seems like the older you get, the more minorities you become a member of. As I never things thought of that. Fall, as things fall apart, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly you do your best work and suddenly people say, God, that's brilliant. Say, don't call me that, man, because, it, you know, it's just a sign that I'm supposed to hang around my neck. Like anything, any word that separates us or makes us different than, than all other people is kind of a drag. It's, again, I've never thought of it that way. Neither have I. <laughs> no, no, I have. There's this album out recorded by Jeff Bridges. And he covers some of your songs on it. Yes, he does. How did you feel about his interpretations of your songs? I was so happy, man. He maxed me out on the happiness thing. To hear him and his seriousness and his artistry about it, I mean, God, it was such a joy. I can't imagine hearing anybody else singing anything I wrote and being any happier than I was when I heard what he did. It was just so straight from the heart and down down to it you know what i mean yeah one of those songs i happen to like a lot and that's the quest what's that one about oh i don't know it's like you know it's like one of those little like inspiration waves that songwriters and people catch not that the wave can't be like huge but kind of like me talking to nashville in the solitude of this room about the fact that it may be time to move on and get back to something that's part of more of like a, a social movement rather than everybody trying to get rich individually or in collaboration with other people. The, you know, there are, there are big voices in the world that aren't heard as much as they were, you know, at one time in our history, and they've been drowned out by all these people who are saying, pay me, praise me, buy me, blah, 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 you know, adulate me, idolize me, and... I was just sort of saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, this is too long an answer for your cool question, man, but I was just sort of saying, like, there are bigger causes out there than the ones that I'm hearing coming from here right now. And it was just my fantasy that somebody might give a damn if I left, you know, that I'd be missed or something, you know? Yeah. Nobody's missed. Julius Caesar isn't missed. <laughs> uh, kidding around, man. One of the great things about making a living in the arts is sometimes you get a chance to meet people who you admire or they have contributed greatly. In our talks one time, I think you told me this in a coffee shop, and you mentioned that you had met John Lennon. I have. And that you knew Bobby Darren. I did. Tell us about that. This is kind of an example of how sometimes our paths put us in the same room or the same place or the same time with certain people. And I guess that's probably more likely to happen to you if you stay on the path of being a writer or an artist. You maybe tend to move in those kind of those currents that are trade winds that carry you into the company of certain like people who are just like phenomenally breathtakingly unusual in what they've done. And I certainly wouldn't consider myself to be of any equal talent to the people you just mentioned. But, you know, it happened, and I wasn't seeking it out. The time with John Lennon was very brief, and it involved other people. And with Bobby Darren, I mean, 
you know, I knew him since I was a teenager until the time he died. Ultimately, we have to become the most blessed people in our lives. Don't you think, Paul? Yeah, I can see that. We have to become the teacher at some point. I think I know what you mean. I'm sure you do. Like, heroes are great because they give you a sense of which way the, the treasure lies, you know, and they inspire you to at least get on that path, if only for a while. But ultimately, like, if you don't become the hero of your own story, I, I don't know, I think we're, we're all supposed to become that. So suddenly it isn't the great ones like Dylan and the Beatles and those guys. Like, we become, it's sort of like discovering our own inner John Lennon, if you want to call it that, or our own inner whoever your hero is, and coming from that place and being as strong as the people who inspired you to feel that way. It doesn't have to be someone that everybody knows. Absolutely right. So many of my heroes are waitresses and the guy who works in the gas station. I mean, you know, seriously, man. Yeah. That's why I, that's why I don't have to live in L.A. and I've lived in L.A. for a long time. I can think of so many people in my lives, in, in my life. That was an interesting Freudian slip, wasn't it, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> I can think of, you know, I go out every day and see heroes. You know, the world's full of heroes, don't you think? I would have to agree. Yeah. So for me, growing up in L.A. and growing up and being around a lot of people who are well-known, I, I love those people, but they're no more my heroes than, like, you know, the person who brought me my coffee today when I went out to breakfast or whatever. Like, of course, a lot of a lot of those people have extremely heroic qualities as human beings, I have to say. Yeah. You're listening to our interview with songwriter and recording artist John Goodwin here on the Paul Leslie Hour. We're going to play a song from his album, The Next Small Thing. This is The Wall Came Down. Some people built a wall to keep emotions out. Thought no one could get through it over or around. Then one day it happened, incredible came true. Wall wasn't stronger than the way I wanted you. And the wall came down. Yeah, the wall came down. Whoa, 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 whoa. The wall came down. Hammers swinging, a million hammers cried, begging for forgiveness when the road was open wide. Says, you don't need forgiveness, you are only helpless tools in the hands of your creators. Now liberation rules, and the wall came down. Oh, oh the wall came down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let me put it like this. Passion built a tower at unbelievable heights. Uh, scatters Jasmine on his angel while she watches the fights on a blue and white TV where her avatar resides. Uh, stares through its telescope on her shoulder in the night and the wall came down. Wall came down, yeah, yeah. But ooh, 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 yeah, yeah. The wall came down. down. Came down. What projects are you looking forward to? I really want to go in with a country band and cut a bunch of these country songs I've written because I've been writing country for a long time. I just want to get a really traditional studio band, some of the old guys, and go in and cut about ten of those songs. And I want to do a guitar vocal album here at home. And I'd like to do a spoken arts, you know, spoken word album of maybe 12 or 15 
song lyrics and take them away from the music and just recite them. People seem to like to hear me do that sometimes. Awesome. What yeah, I don't know what else. Probably going to have another art exhibit down here in about three or four months, and I've had about seven or eight in the Nashville area, which people seem to enjoy. So, What is the best thing about yeah. being John Goodwin? I don't know. Once again, it's sort of like the best thing about anybody being any who, whoever they are. I really like my mind. I like the way I think sometimes. I think I have the power to not only amuse myself, but sometimes amuse other people. And to make people laugh, it's a real cool thing. I like when I paint and do like the, the visual arts. I, I, sometimes I really like what I see, and other people do too. And some people do collect my work. Like it's just for some reason it just flips my switch. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a drag. I've been working on a painting for four months that I know will never be a good painting. <laughs> but I keep working on it, and I don't know why. I've never done that before. Do you feel like a lot of times the things that you do, they're almost something that just comes natural? You couldn't imagine not doing them. You couldn't stop if you tried. I think I had a certain kind of innate talent or astrological tendency to uh, do art, but I could have done any number of things, too, I mean, I don't want to make what I do seem in any way like holy or or precious in the same sense that the waitress who brought me my my eggs and toast today did something for me. I'm just hoping that what I did on my records or in my artwork did something of similar sort of value for somebody else and served them in some way. As I said at the beginning of the interview, I've never welcomed a guest four times. So I'm going to ask a different final question than I normally ask. And I'm completely honored, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you heard my work a long time ago and got it and enjoyed it and it meant something to you. To say the truth, Paul, like aside from certain songs that I get cut on different people's records and songs that end up in some movies and stuff like that, when I do my records, I, I print usually on the new one, I printed 500. On the other ones, I printed maybe 1,000, 2,000. I give 450 away, and it's sort of after that, it's kind of word of mouth because I'm not hugely into the social networking thing right now. I think it's a great thing, but I still have this real old-fashioned streak in me that says, like, you know, good work should have its own legs and walk on its own, not be, like, squeezed by giant machines into 10,000 sausages at one time. You know what I mean? So it's just this old-fashioned thing. You know, it's like writing lyrics by hand or uh, having an address book where I actually, you know, put or a calendar where I actually write in dates and if they fall through, you cross them out. It's really weird, man. I'm just a, I'm a relic. That's what I am. That's what I'll call the next record, The Relic. <laughs> That's actually a pretty cool title. It's not bad if I could explain it. <laughs> probably by the time I got to it, I'd probably have a different concept of myself, you know. Yes, Paul, thank you for your attention and your understanding and being reachable. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for what you've created. My pleasure, man. I just hope it makes some people happy uh, somewhere, sometime, you know. Did you have a final last question? Can't we just go on for another eight hours? <laughs> I, I got some questions I want to ask you an hour, too. <laughs> well, if you have any questions, I've only got one more. My last question I had, what is your definition of a true brother? I don't think there is a definition of a true brother because, like, for instance, I have a biological brother, and he's a true brother. My buddy Jeff Bridges, like, he's a true brother, and you're a true brother. And You know what I'm saying, Paul? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, we, you know, these are people who we just relate to, like, I don't know, unjudgmentally, or we, we have acceptance, or as acceptance in family sometimes comes as a result of being in the same family, like, to extend that to strangers who come into your life and become friends. It's a whole other thing. Want me to play a song for you? <laughs> yes, please. Please do. Uh, any particular one? Hmm, well, there's... What about... It kind of references Dixie. The title is escaping me. Oh, my God, man. Uh, oh, well, it's... Uh, there will be a away. lynch mob in my front yard if I play that song. <laughs> look away. Look away, yeah. Well, you know, play whatever you like. Yeah, I'll play a Wrong Way Parade. Well, you know how much I like that one. Well, I thought that was the one you were going to name anyway, so that's why it's, I, I have it sitting here. <laughs> you know what? Can I 
I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you know I don't want to take you, take as much as you want, Paul. It's you really know what? Bad. I've always wanted to hear you play acoustically. What? Whip down. Now that's a rough song to play acoustically. A, I wrote it in my head, and when I demoed it in L.A., went to a studio and had a great band. I basically said, "Well, I, I could probably play it." Jeff plays it. <laughs> Ah, it's not as much fun to play as some other things. Give me six months to rehearse it, man. We'll do our fifth interview. I'll play the, I'll play the f out of that song for you. You know what? I'd like to hear sometime you record. What's that? Well, I don't know how much my opinion's worth, but I've always wanted to hear you record "September Brings." I did a recording of that back in like when Fred Flintstone was in grammar school. And did it with a band in Northern California, and unfortunately, time like decayed the tape. It was in a trunk, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. All those tapes. I mean, the you know the the sticky stuff's falling off the other stuff. You know, I think Jeff has a copy of it. I don't know. Oh, uh, I like that song a lot. I love his version of that. Don't you? Oh, that's a killer song. Oh. Yeah, I wrote it in a parking lot in 1984. <laughs> so you want me to play one or what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was beating a drum, I was banging a bell, I was marching down Main Street, cocky as hell. I was living a dream, only to find, sometimes the eyes of a dreamer are reality blind. I looked over my shoulder, all my friends were there, time and money to Blow, no mercy to spare. I really thought that I was ahead of the game, but I was a leading a wrong way parade. I was stepping so high, yeah, to the thunder and cheers. I didn't hear the voice of reason talking in my ears, saying there's more. The local charade. If I knew which end was up, I would have been afraid. There were floats and cowboys and beauty queen, aging television stars in old limousines. I thought I had it right. I thought I had it made. That I was leading a wrong way parade. senses turn my life around all my don'ts were done all my dues were paid from leading the wrong way parade yeah i've been leading the wrong way parade yeah 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 no 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 Nice. Thank you, Mav. Thanks for playing that. Totally for you, because you're so cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. Any, any other things you would like to discuss? or? Well, let's see. Oh. I should have played Look Away for you. Do you want but to? It's, it's, it's just a song that could bring down the thunder, you know? I thought about that song a lot since I heard it. And really, anybody that would disagree with what you're saying obviously is still thinking that way. Right. Well, I was trying to speak about my pain with some reverence to uh, circumstances surrounding whatever my situation was at the moment I wrote it. Let me see if I can play that for you. This is live television. <laughs> okay. okay. Losing has a way of breaking your soul Like a real cruel father when no one else knows Still trying to recover from so long ago Look away, Dixieland The 
war should have ended when the treaty was signed. But the angry rebellion is still well and alive. Jackson on the 20, Lincoln on the 5. Look away, Dixieland. Look away to the past. Look away to the past. Look anywhere but your mind. If you did, you would see that in reality, your eyes are just closed, you're not blind. They cling to the Bible like it was a stone. They would hurl at a sinner who will one day be thrown into eternal fire while they're riding home. Look away, Dixieland. They got trucks in the front yard, dogs in the back. They're my brothers and sisters, and I'm proud of that. The forces of Satan are poised to attack. Look away, Dixieland. Look away, Dixieland. Nice. Well, that's a rough one for you, Paul. Well, I mean, that, that was ragged. Once again, I had a different idea of what a song was about. How so? I thought the song was about something entirely different. <laughs> I was oh. totally wrong, apparently. So, so did I, because when I was writing, I didn't exactly know what I was writing. I was, I was thinking, that, thinking about my own life, my relationship with my father. I won't go too far into this, but it's like, you know, losing has a way of breaking your soul. It's like, whether that's being made to feel like a loser or historically being made to feel like a loser, you know, like the South in some way, in a lot of ways, may feel after the Civil War. Hmm. So, so like parental psychological cruelty, whether it was intentional or not, is very similar to spiritual and social historical cruelty. Uh, anyway, that's that was the beginning of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then I went into my, hey, hey, people, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna talk the talk, like walk the walk, like be good to everybody, or don't pretend like you worship somebody who was, you know? Yeah, yeah. Paul, you're a blessing, man. It's always a pleasure to have you listen to the Paul Leslie Hour, and an honor to be joined by a true artist like John Goodwin. In my opinion, recording an album like The Next Small Thing takes a lot of courage. You can find out more information about John Goodwin by visiting his website, babyrecords.com. Thanks for listening. You can find out more information about my interviews by visiting thepaulleslie.com. We're going to leave you with the song that opens the next small thing. Here is John Goodwin with Born Blue. hurt me or shot me down it's no one's fault my heart makes a breaking sound cause some people fly and some walk on the ground and I was born blue yes I was born blue I'm a silver sun with an arrow shining through Straight to the heart and I was born blue When I stand against the sky Do it! I completely disappear I can be dark but then I can be clear in the vault of jubilation, I have cried sapphire tears, cause I was born blue, yes I was born blue. I'm a silver sun with an arrow shining through, straight to the wall, and I was born
The fourth John Goodwin interview on the Paul Leslie Hour featuring acoustic performances with singer and recording artist John Goodwin was hosted and produced by Paul Leslie for Lifestyles Entertainment and Media. Interview recorded by Jeff Pike. Radio special recorded, engineered, and mixed by Henry Jordan at Jordan Digital Studios in Powder Springs, Georgia. For more information, visit thepaulleslie.com. Thanks for listening, and see you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.